Welcome to the Building Culture Podcast. I am your host, Austin Tunnell, and today I am dropping part two of uh, the conversation with Sam Day, who is an architect, urbanist, and infill developer. So hope you enjoy, and if you want to catch the first part of the conversation, just look back at episode eight. Hope you enjoy. Yeah. Um, and, and I can do of- a coffee shop if I live in the whole neighborhood of all that yeah. and count on there being enough residents who can walk to my coffee shop so much so that I don't have to build a parking lot. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I think like, I don't know, what what would you think about, well, Asa is work in a lot of suburban subdivisions because they're too, they just have such low density. But one of the things I think about is what makes Wheeler so strong, even though it's just growing, you know, it's yeah. really just kind of in its infancy in a lot yeah. of ways, but I mean, it's more than its infancy, but it's got a center, yes. you know, and that's what every neighborhood misses. Well, sometimes you'll get like a clubhouse or something, but it doesn't function as a center. And granted, mm-hmm. if you're on acre parcels, you're not going to be able to do this, but I do, I can't help but think like the magic three things at Wheeler, beer, tacos, playground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a, you have those three things and you can activate a space. It yeah. doesn't mean it doesn't take work. It doesn't mean you don't need programming. And granted, the more you add, better. You can add a coffee shop, clarity coffee, you know, it's going to get better. Yeah. But just like playground, beer, tacos. And, and not only do my family go there, but I heard this was really interesting. One of my friends who's not an urbanist doesn't really like know the language and stuff about it. And I was trying to like talk about it. I've been talking to him about it for close to eight months to a year clearly not fully on the same page. I said, let's go to Wheeler on a Friday night and get dinner. And uh, so we went and got dinner when, it, you know, the farmer's market was going out too. And, and so they're, you know, kind of busy out back and fun. And and he was pretty like eyes open to it. Like, I see what you mean now. Yeah. Um, but it was so cool because it was actually when he was explaining it to someone else that he said something. I was like, oh, that's a really good way to think about it. When someone else was pushing back on what we were trying to do now on this project, that he's on board with kind of this urbanism stuff, and the guy's going like, yeah, but not the parking, blah, 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 or parking's too far. This is the project in Edmond. uh, It's somewhere else now. And and, and the guy just explained, he's like, well, what I've learned is you're not going to, you're not going to the restaurant to eat. You're going to the place that is Wheeler. And you happen to be eating there, and you happen to be eating beer there, and you happen to, I'm like, that's it. You're going, like how we framed it like we're not going to taco nation we're going to wheeler and i'm realizing that's actually how i said it to him i said i didn't say let's go let's go to taco nation yeah. i said let's go to wheeler yeah and of course we ate and drank beer and our kids played and we walked around you know and that that is i don't know it doesn't take much to get that small center but i don't know how you can you do well, that in suburbia i mean can we do it in wheeler like it, the condition i'm talking about where you have a coffee shop that's supported by people that can walk to it. We're, we're not there. Right. Now, right. So yeah. we lean on people driving there. It's be, it's visible from the road. We lean on a lot of programming. I mean, from day one, Ashley has been at that nonstop right? farmer's markets and just hosting tons of stuff, getting people right. out there, do it. So you have to supplement it. Right. 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 And, and you could have a great community of 200 people, but it's not going to happen through commerce. Completely organic. It's going to have to happen through, you have a church, you have programming, you do something like right. that. Right. But I think that's actually kind of cool. That's not like a bad thing to be no. scared of. Like no, I, I would say, and I know y'all haven't like, and we, I think Wheeler's just done so well with that. It's like, I, I hear a lot of developers too scared to like quote unquote subsidize something because like subsidy is just such a bad word. Yeah. And I'm going, I mean, man, all small businesses, like if you want to like, they're going to be subsidized in some way in a new development, probably yeah. whether it's because it's a percent of revenue, rent, but like the, the amount of, but if you play the long game, if you're willing to play the long game, yeah. I think you can I think you can create the most value, you know, certainly the most good, I guess certainly you'd say. Certainly the most good. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you lose a few percentage points on your RR, I don't know, but like Yeah, I mean the difficult I think the most difficult part about suburbia in that sense is like all the ownership is so fractured. Yeah. Right, we can do it in Wheeler's we can theorize at least, okay, it's worth us spending all this money on a Ferris wheel and park and all this stuff. Like there's no money made there, but um, we're doing placemaking. There's enough land around it that, that is controlled that it kind of makes sense over time to build that much value. But if you build like, if I can buy two lots and build an eight plex in some suburban area of some city, it's kind of hard for me to theorize that, okay, 
what can I do placemaking that's justified from a, from a financial standpoint? It's hard to say. It's hard yeah. to say I can do much. I would still probably might do some of that just because like, I enjoy it. I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's, right. it, it adds value to the neighborhood still. But the increment of value, like it's again, what I, all of the value I created through my placemaking is just accruing to all of the land I don't own around yeah. me. Right. That's right. so because true. It's so hard to control that land. Yeah. It's one, I think it's one of the most difficult things with suburbia say like the possibility of me actually going in and buying out four blocks to do something crazy is, is unlikely that I'm going to get right. all the buyers to fold at a reasonable price. It would take a very long time. It takes a very long time. <laughs> and or you'd have to be incredibly wealthy. If I can't control all that right. dirt, then is it worth it to, for me to come in and do a small project work really hard, do some placemaking efforts, really right. make this neighborhood kick And you ass. don't know. But then I just made all the lots around me expensive and I helped myself a little bit, but I, I had a very small right. net in which to catch the or bucket to catch the rain that I helped make. Right. And all of my other landlord, neighbors, whoever, they caught all the rest. And now it's hard for me to, even, it, I can't even grow my project. I can't uh -huh. buy their lots because I made them too expensive. So I think that's probably the hard, one of the hardest things about infill, being an infill developer, maybe, is that. It's yeah. like, um, I certainly don't want people going into suburbs and, and blowing up blocks and to build new things. But it's also hard to really financially justify doing a ton of legwork on, on projects in areas that you just don't really can troll no it's it's future. it's it's true yeah you're gonna take risk it's gonna be hard to get money because comps aren't gonna be there but after you go the you vote you you, <laughs> you made it much yeah which is a good thing it's you know like thing. you're saying yes. but like it's hard it's one thing if you're just like uh, some wealthy business or something you can just go do stuff but for people like you i mean you're you're an individual running self-employed running a business and doing stuff i'm an individual running a business having to do stuff like we're small scale like yeah we can't yeah, it doesn't make sense for we have such an opportunity cost, you know, with mm -hmm. what we're able to do that if we, you know, do that, it's at the expense of other things. And it's just not really worth it most of the time. Yeah, from financial simple, I think yeah. you still think it's sort of worth it from like a community spiritual right. self, whatever. Yeah, thing, but, um, you know, yeah, like I mean, more than any business yeah. perspective. Yeah, it actually really maybe that's what it is. It's like, hey, it needs to be people in the neighborhood starting doing things, you know, like, hey, you, you call this your home. All right, cool. Like, make it better um, and making that easier. <laughs> but, um, gosh, I, I, we could talk about this in a long time, but I want, I want to actually talk about a couple of technology things that I think can really shape how we think about things, too, because this, cause, cause this yeah. does affect suburbia in that, you know, the way suburbia is, you've got this big, I don't know, we, well, you know, Chuck Murray would call it a strode going down somewhere, and then you've just got developers buying these big chunks of land off the strode with an entrance and then you know there's one entrance in the neighborhood a bunch of houses back out the same entrance and then you know over yeah. there's another one like that um so they're all disconnected but and, and maybe there's not enough room for a center within a single neighborhood but what if we had more distributed shopping centers is one of the things i've been thinking about rather than all this kind of big and super centralized mm -hmm. with the introduction of things like e-bikes could we, you know how like in, in Oklahoma City and everyone in wherever they are can think about their own little, where you've got little districts and things where for us it's Paseo and Plaza and these little cores and in, in just neighborhoods and in suburbia, I'm wondering if you could do that at a smaller scale with e-bikes when you don't have to park as much, you know, when it's like eight subdivisions being serviced by this one thing. And I've been thinking about delivery services. So two things, e-bikes and delivery services where, because Grocery store is such a big one. You mm -hmm. want gro you want a corner mm -hmm. store, but everything I've ever read and talked to, grocery stores are so hard. They so don't hard. make any money except yeah. at massive scale. And going, okay, so the, the idea of a corner grocery store in a neighborhood is, is is so unlikely in most scenarios. Just to like, if I'm just going to accept that, but then go, wait, you know, what if you didn't have to have the grocery store? Because a lot of people were relying on delivery, and then we we made our third places other things. Because I don't like the idea of just like, hey. Everything is delivery. We never have to leave our house. I don't like that idea. But what if some of these harder things that do require more centralization and therefore more cars and more parking, frankly, because that's the only way for us to manage it? What, yeah. if we, what if those were relying on delivery and then the experiential things 
you know. Sure. Like grocery store is going to be hard to make a, a good experience, no matter what. Like it's not, it's, 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 there's some cool grocery stores out there. Yeah. I'm not knocking that, but um, right. When in the era of delivery, I think place is competing only on experience. Yeah. I mean, maybe shopping for clothes, I'd rather feel it, whatever. But for the most part, like you said, we're going to Wheeler, not Taco Nation. Right. Um, it's about the experience. Now, the question is, can I actually, do I have enough of a catchment out there to, where I can actually create an urban experience or just kind of semi-urban or something where it's enjoyable to like walk down a street somewhere? Like is, right. is, we're talking, yeah, Dallas, Fort Worth suburbs or something, right? Like, um, like how much area do I need to service before I can get to that? And is it something where I can actually rely on e-bikes and stuff? I don't know. I don't know yeah. what the answer. I think it's an interesting proposition. Like, okay, can I get like six restaurants, right. three retail? Uh, you know, we used to do this all the time. We yeah. used to have region neighborhood shopping center. Plaza started it. A lot of yep. these places we started with in Oklahoma City that we love. Right. You know, that that's how they started. Yeah, they're they some of the most popular places. Right. You know. Um but those relied on on neighborhoods with densities of eight units an right. acre and stuff, you know, and, and more than units an acre. Um, it was people an acre too. It was right. more people. And today, you know, these subdivisions outside Dallas, Oklahoma City, whatever, we're talking about really low densities, right? Like yeah. two people an acre, three, three you know, <laughs> Makes it really three hard. people. A, and so those e-bikes, e-bikes helped though. Like e-bikes helped though, right? Okay, yeah. so if I say I'll, I'll walk 15 minutes i'll walk three quarters of a mile okay that can go that far i'll ride my bike eh, 15 minutes maybe that's gonna get me four miles yeah if i take my e-bike maybe it's gonna give me eight right seven you know and, I might, and maybe i'm gonna be willing a, to go yeah. for 20 minutes because it's more fun and not right. spending or something so it is a really serious question of like well can we counteract the lower densities that not only units breaker but people breaker and we counter that out with better mobility that doesn't take up much space as cars, yep. which is, could be e-bikes, right? It could change. It, it all, you know, this is all an equation of like how enjoyable is the experience, which yeah. controls how far people are willing to walk or bike and how dense is it, which controls how many people can go come to your place, right? And then just how good is the infrastructure too? I mean, yep. it, it all of this kind of, creates this formula of like how many people what's your mode share how many people are going to be arriving at your space by something other than a car yeah and the goal is to get that as low as possible for if for no other reason that you don't have enough space at your place to park all of it yeah it's hard to park all of it and create a good walking environment the oh, parking yeah. just takes up so much space no i mean chis- i mean there's a lot of examples and uh, there's a there because everyone, even d- big developers, are trying to go after yeah. the walkable. They know, they, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. And I remember even in this is a while ago. Houston has one where it was like someone bought a bunch of land, put a bunch of shops, walkable, and then a bunch of parking garages around and surface parking. Yeah, <clears throat> still all a very unpleasant experience in my opinion. Um, but we have it here too, in the you know Chisholm Creek and stuff like yeah. that. It's like the new version of the strip, the mall, which is better. I do think it's an upgrade from like the internal mall where you walk in, you know. And at least it's, it's a little bit from that. It, it's an upgrade from that, you know. And and I mean, I can't blame people because what are you going to build if you can't? Park? You have to park it. Like I understand that. Yeah. Even though I kind of will poke at people that I feel like are only concerned about profits and nothing else. But I mean, like I get why this stuff happens. People aren't stupid. Um. It's a million times better if you take the two, I mean, Chisholm Creek, whatever. You take the two strip malls and have them facing each other oh, and gosh. have the parking aside. Right. And it's still, and then it's a, it's an island, right. but it's at least an island where I could like hang out and right. do I, more than one thing. That's the I biggest sip thing. Sip a from, coffee yeah. on the sidewalk or whatever, not sit a co- sip of coffee facing a sea of parking. Right. So, I mean, and the argument for that is like, well, even if I could get everyone there by e-bike, Right. What am I going to connect to? Yeah. Right. Urbanism is about like, well, I could theoretically, you know, go bike from Paseo to, to Plaza or whatever. Like in those scenarios, I think this is kind of the thing you're talking about with trying to create these experience places amongst the Strode world. Um, even if we can do e-bikes, there's I don't know that there's a 
places that we can connect to where like mm-hmm. shrinking the sea of parking around it doesn't really help us that much. Yeah. It's Besides true. You're still that or it's still such a destination. And that's, what's it's interesting about the life of just basically the vast majority of people in the United States, including myself. And I live a couple miles from downtown in this urban quote unquote neighborhood. It's urban location yeah. wise, but it's 7,000 square foot lots. Um, but like I, you know, I, if I'm going somewhere, it's to do some specific thing. And then when I'm done doing that specific thing, I go home. And, and I get that that's always the case, generally speaking, you're always going out to do something. But like, what I mean by that is if you're going out to everything is just so organized in American life, it's, we are going to go to dinner at seven o'clock, we're going to meet here. And then we're going to go home afterwards, or we're going to go here. And then we might drive somewhere to get ice cream afterwards or something. And then we're going to go home. Versus like just that feel of even Wheeler's, you know, it's just too small yet to really have that, but it, you know, it's going to grow to that. And then Carlton Landing, even example, but just, or the, yeah, like right, you might go there to get tacos because you're hungry, but then you are just there. You just yeah. be there. You're on the playground for a little, you grab the beer, you walk into a couple shops, you yeah. go play top golf for a second. I don't know. Putt, putt. Like, we're, like you're saying the connectivity of it all where. Yeah. I mean, that's what I really love. Unplanned love things about happen. Urbanism is the spontaneity. Yeah. Like, I love living on the plaza, or the, when I used to live in Paseo, is like my friends just stop by in and out. Right, right, right. When you or saw I, me at the, the restaurant, like just a month ago, I was like, oh, hi. Yeah. Like, that, I mean, I get that stuff happening to me once a, a week. But right. I almost never get in my car, right? I'm, I'm riding. It's because your radius is I'm quite outside, small. Outside. So, yeah, my radius is small. Um, I'm able to, like, I live in these areas and people know that. So, if they're in the area, sometimes I stop by or I'll be out. Um, getting drinks, dinner, whatever, and be like, oh, see someone I know, like, hey, come back to my house and hang out. What I I love that. I don't know if it's just partly like, um, I like a surprise. I don't like to plan. Maybe I don't know. I don't know. Right. I think I do like to plan. So I'm not sure why I love that so much. But that, like, I re- that's what's drawn me to urbanism. I yeah. think like besides the design and all of that. Um, but. I think that experience of urbanism is what really draw. I mean, the the CO two and the loneliness, all this other stuff is is bonus right. to me. The the public finance and all that, you know, that yeah. stuff I've kind of learned around the way on on the way of, of my journey with urbanism. But like, it's that spontaneity that I think has really hooked me about. It's so it's good, really love that. It's really interesting you're saying that because it's something that I've been thinking about lately. Of um. Because you're right. It's not like uh, I was right. I was trying to write about it the other day. And it's not that like, I don't necessarily like, it's not a human thing to like, enjoy being surprised all the time in no. a bad way, right? Like where I'm going to do something it's like surprise. Oh, you're like, uh, it, it can be startling at the same time. So there's kind of the extreme where we're, we don't want to be surprised all the time. No. But the other one is we don't monotony is also horrible. We hate it. Totally. We're so bored. Totally. We're, you know, and so that middle of just the, the, the idea of potential and possibility. It doesn't even mean something happens, but just like the life around you and, and the buzz of things happen. And I don't mean like I want to be in the New York City and busy all the time or something. No. I just mean, once again, just more urban places where you might run into someone, this might happen, whatever. And there's this um, there's this life in the air. And I would call it like a little bit of like magic of just that idea of it's not a conscious thing, evil, just like something could happen like the idea of possibilities. And I think that's yeah. like life giving for humans or something. I don't 100%. know. I've been thinking about my experience of that. And like, why do I enjoy that? It's not that I like being, I would not say I like being surprised. Yeah. But I, I feel like, Ooh, yeah. Like I think two things, not, life's not so stale. Mon- monotony is just like you wake up, you know, you have a monotonous life and, and I think you wake up four years later and you're like, Oh my gosh, what you know, you just sort of like you fast forward. Yeah. Through, yeah. M- mentally. And and surprises spontaneity can sort of slow things down a bit for you. That's um, interesting. Yeah. But I think the other thing that I really like is like, you know, you plan something a month in advance, a week, two days, or have a routine every week. I do this, and some days you just don't feel like it, right? Yeah. You're just like, I, yeah. I, I thought I was going to feel like it, and I don't. Versus like on the kind of in urbanism, you run into someone you know, you can talk to them for a minute, or you are feeling social, and I can say, hey come back to my house for a drink, whatever, you know, like you get to sort of respond to it's like being able to plan your vacation three days before. And you're like, I'm really feeling craving going (laughs) to the beach. Let's hop in the private jet and like how much more enjoyable it can be just because you're responding to the need you have. Right. And I think socialization, you know, they've, 
this sort of like hunger, thirst, whatever, we're sometimes responding to our needs and we have loneliness for a a reason that's like, Hey, we got to refill on this. And sometimes it's better not to plan. You know, I, I I miss that about being a kid and, and like the unplanned hangouts. I think those are really healthy. I really enjoy them. And I think like being able to, in the moment decide, Hey, I would like to have some social interaction with this person or not being able to make that choice in the moment for yourself. It's so nice. It's really nice. And that, and that, the only thing I'd add to that, or just like I would add on to that, this, the ability to have small touches with people totally is to have that five minute, com- heck, to have a Hi. two minute conversation, <laughs> yeah. to have a five minute conversation, to have a 15. Cause there's so many times my, my brother and sister in law, my sister and brother in law who live a 10 minute drive from here, they're in Gatewood, right? Yeah. By you. And uh, I, I see them quite regularly on the weekend, but it, w- there's so many times we're like, man, I wish we lived within walking distance to each other because we'd see each other a not, lot more, not because they're going to come over for dinner every night, but because my my brother-in-law has a sauna in his backyard. And when it's a 10-minute nice. drive, I don't want to do that at 5.30 at night, I'm done with work, and then drive there to get in the sauna. For no. But if he like lived within a, a ten, even a 10-minute bike or five-minute bike, like I would just be like, oh, I'll, I'll be right. Let me go do that and come right back. And I would get so many more small touches with him. Mm-hmm. And then same with my other neighbors, who I only see them when I'm taking out trash. Um, versus, which is fun because I, we, we stop and chat a lot, but you know, just the opportunity to do the small stuff. Yeah. A hundred percent. Sometimes small touches all you want. Yeah, exactly. Like, hey, you don't, you're not I, best friends with everyone. <laughs> to see you. I don't need that. You don't need to be best friends with everyone. Okay. And actually we're, uh, um, I want to kind of wrap up just with some kind of like faster questions okay. not i wouldn't call them rapid fire per se might be slow answers um uh, yes yeah, go feel free to take your time um and actually let me just double check it's recording yes. I, I will say like two three minutes ago i just had this panic in my heart of oh, it, what if it's not recording um okay i've got a few questions on instagram that i'll pull up in a second but uh great do you have, um, and this is just kind of like a general life question, especially as you know, small business owner, your new dad, all that. Um, do you have any habits or routines that are really important to you? Um, it could be anything. Bedtime yeah, routine, I've, routine. any routines I've had have been sort of blown out of like I, my routine is I change uh, my three month old son's diaper at five a.m. every morning. I yeah, they've really been. Uh, I have weeklies, you know, I have a few weekly things that yeah. just like, they're like standing meetings and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't follow, I don't have a ton of routines. And yeah. I think part of that has to do with the type of work I do is yeah. like, I I have deep, long work sessions that'll go five hours, six mm. hours. And, and sometimes I'm, can be in the moment for them and sometimes I can't. And so I really try to just re- again respond to like what i'm feeling is like okay am i into this project i'm just gonna like go i'm not going it's so valuable for me to be here and totally invested in this and it takes a long time for me to load up kind of all the things i'm thinking about in terms of a pro forma in terms of a plan and all these things code and i can't don't want to set it down and so that part of my work, I think, has led me to to sort of not have as much routine. But yeah. I think other parts of my work have suffered because of not doing that and, and maybe even relationships. So I'm s- trying to introduce more of those this year, more routines yeah. of just like, hey, I'm going to like read for an hour, five, you know, like right. five times a week, doing my Spanish lesson five times a week at like this time and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I certainly, I've almost never had daily yeah. routines. Well, even that, for me, that I actually think that's quite like an interesting habit. Because I'm, uh, the fact that you're like, I'm going to block out five hours and do this one thing. Yeah. Because task switching and text and I'm email. Not, I'm not very good at ta- task switching. I'm always worse. I'm always like. Right. No, that, and there's so much science out there. And I'm like, I'm trying to reorganize how I do my life a little bit more to like big chunk times phone on do not disturb unless it's yeah. my wife or you know someone else important like just don't so i can like concentrate for a few hours yeah i think it's harder and harder to do it as as life goes on <laughs> you have more people that like it is you're working with report to you perhaps or, yeah. or just more people dependent on getting an answer right from you at, at some point so i'm kind of in a phase where i 
I haven't had that. I'm kind of switching into having with a kid and then working yeah. with a few other people. And I, I haven't figured it out. I've, I've blocked out some times where I'm like, okay, these are the times I'm, I'm available and listening and responding fast and meaning. And then I'm trying to block out others again, where I can get back to the deep work, but, but the deep work is shrinking. Things yeah. are attacking it from all sides. Right. And I'm worried I'm I'm not going to be as good at the others. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have any top podcasts you listen to? I was like asking this question. Oh man, um, there's so many out there. But there's so there's... many. So podcasts I like. It could be about anything. It doesn't have to be about urbanism by any means. Yeah, about urbanism. There's a great um, podcast, the Henry George podcast. Oh. I think it's called, which is a, a podcast funny. totally on on Landrin and some of the concepts we talked about today. Oh, cool. So That's a good one. dive okay. into that if if you're interested. I'll put that um, in the uh, show notes. Is that on YouTube? I don't know if it's okay. on YouTube. I listen to Ezra Klein's podcast religiously and um, Adam Tooze's as well. Who's Adam Tooze? Should I know? Maybe he's um, sometimes kind of he teaches at Columbia. He's What's his last name? Tooze. I think it's T O O Z E. Okay. Um. Economist teaches at Columbia. I think cool. they do a weekly podcast. It's often like global cool. economic stuff. Um, those are the three I listen to. Well, it's good. Uh, I don't listen to the Henry George one as much. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It was, re- it was relevant. <laughs> what about, uh, have you had any uh, books that have changed the way you think or even like act in, in the world, you know? Like... Books on yourself, social. Anything. It could be. It could be. Urban. For example, I give. Uh, I'll give you my example. I read Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan oh, in shit. 2011. Yeah. And it literally is one of those books that just it changed. It opened up a new world for me, and I started eating in a different way. I started thinking in a different way. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't even hard. I wasn't like I'm going to be healthy now. I mean, there was some of that, but it was just like, holy cow, what? I just, you know. So that's kind of what I mean if I. It, it like changed who I was after reading, uh-huh. it, you know. Yeah, I mean that is one. This one, I think that's one probably for. Oh, you read that one? People. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, I've read most of his books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in defense uh, of food and. I anything. that's short. Right? Yeah, that one's shorter than. So, uh, a place of my own. He wrote one on architecture way back in the day. I think. It was Did he like really? His first. He's I didn't even know that. The, I know he's into writes. mushrooms and things. Yeah, though. and he wrote one on that. Yeah. Uh. I think that changed the way I thought about psychedelics. Oh, so you read that one? Yeah, I read that one. Recommend too. it? Yeah, I think it's worth reading okay. for sure. I think it kind of depends on what sort of person you are. I mean, I think it's just conclusion is like everyone who wants to do drugs shouldn't. Everyone who doesn't want to should. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> that's it's hilarious. Sort of, oh. um, <laughs> but it, it was interesting. And I think, yeah, he's done a lot of interesting writing on, on yeah. the relationship of nature and, and humans and what we think of. Um, one I read recently that I think's really changed how I've um, thought about land use and stuff is called um, Regenesis. And I'm trying to remember the author's name. He's a sort of, I'll, I'll probably just look it up. So we don't. Regenesis? Uh, yeah. It's okay. like how to feed our earth without um, starving something. Oh, cool. Um, but it's basically on agricultural sprawl. Oh, and interesting. Thinking about his, his argument is like, well, you know, one or two percent of the earth is is human like development roads and buildings and all of that. The rest is pretty much agriculture, right? And then maybe twenty percent is undisturbed wilderness. Right. It's like a lot of agriculture. And like what we're doing out here in terms of monoculture and oh, yeah. bleaching of soil. So he talks like about that. All of this, yeah, is like is is kind of disturbing. And, you know, maybe we need to be worried as much about the, the agricultural sprawl as the suburban sprawl. I would agree. I, I don't know. I haven't read a book on it a lot, or this book or anything, but I, I remember I mean, there's studies out there that show that there's only like 30 something or more crop rotations left in the soil. And yeah, because we've just depleted it so severely with our fertilizers and pesticides. And yeah, mm, yeah it's 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 what, amazing. Not good. I do a whole podcast on that, even though I don't even know what I'm talking about. I just, yeah, I know. I just, <laughs> I just read stuff and it's like, wow. I want to have someone on the podcast that can talk about that, though. Um, Another one I, I would recommend to people, there's actually probably two that I think would go hand in hand if you're a developer. They're both sort of on the history of um, development and both the author's names are going to escape me, I think. Um, 
One is called um, Rise of the Community Builders. And it's kind of about the creations of the first suburbs and, and mostly in California and like how developers influence and, and real estate agents as well influenced, um, started to help create zoning laws and lobby for that. And just sort of like how the American subdivision as we know it today came to be. Wow, that's that. I, I would be very interested. That's a pretty yeah, interesting book as well. Um, and then the other one is by Sarah Stevens. I think it's it's called um, Oh, discovering or developing expertise, and it's sort of like that, but about uh, the in the urban sense, like ULI, the response to that. I mean, it, it tracks a little bit of of suburbia mm. and then kind of uli and the lobbying for um urban renewal and yeah. all of that it's just about i mean both of these are about like the creation of developers as right. we know them today right developers don't want to think they have a history like architects and all that but, but they do and it's shorter than we think right no it's interesting and, i've never really read into that kind of stuff honestly okay. so I'm, I'm quite curious yeah and it's a, all the intersection of like how yeah how how developers kind of lobbied for for the land use we have today and i mean it, it may, maybe it blames developers too much yeah. these histories like maybe you kind of like well whoops yeah <laughs> um but it it's really fascinating and i think in both of them and more maybe in developing expertise you you start to get a sense and i wish i had another book that that i could wreck that that track this more um cohesively of just like how much the financialization of real estate really started to play into the built See, form. I want to read about that. If you like, ever find a book about yeah, that. And, and the, actually I'll send you an, an article, um, but it sort of talks about the savings and loan collapse and how we sort of pressed um, American real estate into about like 19 different forms. And like, these are the only things we can build. Right. You have the community center strip mall, you have the power center, you have this, you have single family, you have garden apartments, you have Texas donut. And like, those are the things we build because those are the assets which can be pooled into one like type. And we can say, oh, we're buying the same thing. Yes. You're four, buying, four big investment funds. Yeah. Four You're people's 401ks million and pension shares funds. Of, and of yep. X type of property. And and we can know it's like to like. And you've seen that go, happen from with everything, right? Yep. It used to be someone would come buy your grain and you'd look at your grain and say, blah, blah, blah. And then as you get to a certain scale, it becomes commodity. It's just right. sold standardized. Right. It's all standardized, right? right? So real estate. It doesn't matter if it's coming from California or New York. It's the same or wherever, you know, it's yeah. the same corn. We're paying this much per We pay this much kilogram. per foot. This, da, da, yeah. da, 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 da. And in some ways you could say, well, that's great in that, you know, we've tried to make real estate. It's easier to finance. It's easier to build because it's easier to finance. Um, but it's also like, man, talk about monoculture and maybe not not much resiliency in the system and just uninspiring places yeah is kind of like this everything to say and what is part of you know why if everything looks the same in the right. united states that's been built in the last that's uh, such a good one I, I would like to have like to talk to the amount that you're like you're saying if that financial incentives have shaped the built world is probably hard to overestimate yeah just like we talked about you can't you have five units oh that's another thing yeah and right. like people don't because it's just not like we don't know about a ton of stuff and we're in the business and there's probably all sorts of things that we don't understand how things shaped this or that or how this came about and we just kind of because it's so easy when you just you live in the world and you kind of just generally speaking accept the world for what it is because you can't constantly question everything all the time sure and then so like one day you're just like wait a second hold on you know and you, you are able to trace something back and you're like how many more of those things are there yeah <laughs> of, uh, um, i mean you don't want to just blame financialization building code has shaped it zoning has shaped you know all these things but it's ended up that like all these stressors have created that there's only you know 15 different things that really get built yep and um it, it and they all get built kind of in the same locations and next to each other. And there's this pattern right, there, there's a like, reason it makes sense. There's a re it's efficient. It is efficient. It's and, and from a certain, I don't even know it's efficient. It's efficient from a, from yeah, a it's form. predictable. The form, form is a, predictable, but it, I don't think right. it's that resilient. No. It's and very the, dependent on, on re, mostly auto transit. Right. And it's, 
only like it is a it's really in my opinion it is a financial product like yeah. that's ultimately yes, what it is, it is a financial it's product. a financial product that you know in the form of, 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 of an apartment complex but um to wrap this up i've got some just questions from from uh instagram of just people asking things so i'll just pick out a few random ones and uh actually this is a good one cj robertson how does someone who wants to be a developer get started? <laughs> I think it, it depends on where you're starting right. from. It, and it depends on what market you're in too, right? If you want to like do ground up stuff and you don't have a ton of capital, it's a lot easier, I think, to start in a market that um, where costs aren't very high, but it still has to be that like rents are sort of trending up, populations trending up, right? So like it's part of the reason I came back from Berkeley to live in Oklahoma City, <laughs> we lived in really hard for me to be a low capital developer in no. Berkeley, right? So that's one thing. So move to a city where you can do that. Right. I don't know, Memphis, Oklahoma City, uh, Fort right. Worth or whatever, where entitlements aren't that hard. Um, and there's a lot of ways. If you have experience, if you're one of these, if you're a real estate agent, if you're an architect, you know, it's a little easier. But you go work for a development shop or, or go go talk to a developer you know bring them a deal mm -hmm. so go do the research figure out hey i think this lot's good yeah partner with me on it i mean everyone will tell you this but don't try to make money the goal on your first deal is not to make money yeah it's to prove that you're worth investing in it's a good it's right? a good way to say it yeah and it's to prove also to the community that you do good work right and that you know the next time you go for entitlements it might be easier right um, so yeah, it's, it's, I, I, it's hard to say depending on where, where someone's at, right. you know, and, but start and, small and, and in the right market is, is pretty good in, in the house. And don't quit your job easy. unless like, you're don't, like, no, don't quit like, your job unless you're great. just like really, 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 really ready or something job. and all in. But yes. like, this is something that I, I, what, I never know when people are asking this, but usually like, I'll say something of like, yeah, I mean, start with the, you can do new construction, like you're saying, or you could buy an old house and fix it up. You could be a duplex or a fourplex. Yep. You could you could fix build it up yourself on a weekend, or you can pay a GC to do it all. Whatever. Yeah, you, build an ADU. You learn the permitting the process. Learn how inspections totally. work. Learn how do you get the financing on a, just a basic construction. Because I didn't know that until I did it. You can read all the books till you're blue in the face, totally. but until you actually go through it and have those conversations, it's all very scary. Or it's just like it's you remember just it better. You remember it better if you yeah. actually do it. Yeah. And like yeah, and and if you can managing it's great too if you could build yeah. an adu and manage it and see what actually goes wrong with the building see good. what ha what tenants are looking at when they rent um i think that provides good good experience to bring into your next project as well this one's kind of along the same lines but i think maybe just a, a more nuanced answer to it but um seb.pdf uh says um as an arc student and aspiring builder i'm curious so an architecture student and aspiring builder i'm curious how do you pivot into construction well i don't do construction right <laughs> that's good so yeah i mean that's part of me i think that i'm like worse at the routines or something else so just like but you know well the thing is though i mean you worked with a gc totally but you also know construction much better or like you know construct like construction details sure. and things and like how buildings get yes. put together yes and not and I don't think that's taught in schools per se. Maybe it was no. taught in your school. Like, but how did I think? I think probably a couple of my studios did better than average. But yeah, it's really hard to learn that in architecture. How did school. you learn then? Um, I it's a good question. Being out at job sites, being in CA, I think a lot. You know, yeah. I'm interested in it from and you know like another podcast I follow the Unbuild It podcast, uh, construction science. I've got. I think. Yeah. I, I know what you're talking about, but I haven't actually listened um, to it. But I think being out there and, and really seeing it and construction, it just takes time to learn construction. You have to right. actually be in it and draw it. And like, I don't know, when I came out of architecture school, I don't feel like I knew it very well. Right. Maybe five years in. I know it. I still don't know all types. Like, you could right. be a type two tower. I'd be. Ooh, oh, gosh. I mean, me. Scary. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah you start talking about different types of construction. I'm just, I don't know. Yeah, no, wood, I have wood no idea how a skyscraper gets built, frankly. Pretty, pretty freaking well, you know? And, I mean, but still, you know, I don't know it as well as any of the trades out there. Right. It's their thing. Um, right. But it really, I think, frees you up as an architect once you, you start drawing with a lot more confidence, once yeah. you start understanding how it goes together. And um, 
yeah, it's it it just really is. It takes a long time to get literate. In it. it does. Construction I, is. I don't feel like it's hard. It's complex. Yeah. There's so much going on. It's probably simpler if you're doing a masonry building where it's just like one thing to go, but, but in a, it should be, but it should be, well, the masonry <laughs> itself is much harder, but in terms of like, like all these things you have to think about oh, yeah. in terms of, yeah. of moisture and, and insulation, no, a lot. And all these things interacting. Um, complicated uh, no you're i think like being on the and job site is so good like whether it's your job site or someone else's whether you're in school or after school because like just being around it you're going to pick up so being around it intentionally and the thing is like i don't know if you felt this but like i mean most people if you don't know something you're going to be uncomfortable and so like if you're an architect and you don't know much about construction and you're on a construction site it can be uncomfortable just like if i'm in a somewhere and something i'm not familiar with especially if i'm in charge of something but i'm not really know yeah. you know like it can be uncomfortable but it's more like just taking that humble approach and realizing it and just learning listening to the subs this, this is stupid it's questions tough, it's and tough really. it's tough better. why are you doing to, like yes, whatever yes. it is why do you do this why do you do that and you'll start picking up mm -hmm. the lingo you'll start knowing and by the way you'll get like i'm guessing totally. you, you know your gcs will respect you more totally. even if subcontractors that don't work directly for you will sub you know because one you can appreciate something they did in a sophisticated more sophisticated way but totally oh. i mean it's an awkward relationship you're the architect you're supposed to sort of be the boss that can approve or reject right. can reject work <laughs> right but right all the trades know that you know less than them about what they're doing right so it's a little bit of antagonistic like no. of like hey who's this idiot who doesn't know much and is still gonna boss me around so i think you just approach it with that humility of right like especially when you're fresh out of school and, and like, just ask, just ask a ton of questions and stuff. Why do you do this? Da, 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 da. And eventually you do that two, three, four years, all of a sudden you're going to be like, we shouldn't do it like that. Yeah. I don't want to do it like that. And my relationship with subs is both now, right? Yeah. I go, or I, I'm not supposed to talk to subs when I'm out there with the GC, Hi, yeah. you know, <laughs> like I, you know, it's back and forth. It's a, Hey, what about this? Yeah. And they're like, well, we did this. Okay. Or why do you do like that? I mean, it's a lot. Now it's a, I still know more, but right. I'm considering more elements of the building too. Right. Of how it goes, like, how's it going to look? How's it going to interact with other things in the building? And it's more, it's, it can be back and forth. Right. Once you get that, that knowledge, but yes, be just ask these, these guys have been doing it for 20 years, you know, yeah. but, but some of them have been doing Stuff may be wrong for 20 years. Right. That, that's true. So You're, stay deep on the podcast. That's so good on. point. I have gotten a lot of bad advice from totally. Like totally. where they just don't know what they're talking about. I've also had great totally. ones where I'm like, oh, we, we should do that. that. That's such a better idea than mine. I didn't know what I was talking about. Great. Thank yes. you. Yes, but exactly. It's back and forth like that. Be careful. Yeah. Yeah. You get a concrete <laughs> stuff that tells you that if you don't put enough water in it, there's going to be air bubbles and the concrete's going to break. Or oh, you're so, yeah. It's just like, all right. Um, let's see. Uh, I'll just do a, a couple more. Um, let's see. Ha, this is kind of fun. Um, favorite, most challenging part of being a new father from E. E. J. Smith. Do you know him? E. J. Smith. Oh, uh, that's Who knows? Photo. Maybe. Uh, Man, there's not. That's what he looks like. No. I do know him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. I think my favorite part is is just like hit, watching him recognize things and look at things. Watching my my son Cash like just like see you or see something or just like every day is almost the exact same as the day before, except it's just same. he's just recognized one more thing. Right, and it's 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 amazing. It's amazing to kind of watch someone learn and try to unravel what they're thinking about you know uh -huh. like we should probably be doing that with everyone but we can since we can talk right we're just like oh we're, they're gonna tell us what they're thinking and yeah they, and they're not you know we're not we we but with him i'm always just kind of like oh maybe he's scared of the dark maybe he's a, a you know you're just like trying to read him so intently because he can't talk <laughs> <laughs> and i like i think that's a good good practice you know like we're all we can only communicate 20 percent 40 percent of what we actually think and feel in whatever right. words if we're being totally honest yeah and so i think it's good yeah, we're that. limited by our words yeah know. that's what i'm saying like, we're not like even yeah. if we're trying our best right. to be honest we can do that and so i think it's good practice for me to be like oh i should approach all relationships like that it's interesting be like i should be reading more subtext i should be reading more body language i should right. be trying to put myself in their shoes better and i you have to do it with them right they're right. just like 
Yeah, you're trying to interpret because you can't. Why are you screaming? Why are you done? Yeah, that's that's a really uh, that's really interesting. I like that. I will say, just I'm kind of answering the question myself, but like my what I've noticed very much along those lines. But it's like I look at that because I know exactly what we're talking about. Like they just they're different the next day. Like I don't, mm -hmm. or sometimes it can take a few days or a week. But I swear, I mean, they're just changing so fast. Maybe that's why we recognize it because it's very fast. Yeah. Um, but there's just something like. What is the right word? I just, I just use, I don't know how to use it besides kind of just like magical and mysterious about it. We're just like this thing that's in front of me is like growing and changing. And there's like just more depth. Like sometimes our daughter is coming up on four. Her name's Amelia. And she'll just like one day I'll come in and she'll just like look at me. And I'm like, yeah, you just, just see them me see more. She's ever yeah. looked at me before. And there's like a depth there that's yeah. within it when you're like, whoa. And it's just, it, you can't explain it. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's very totally. cool. Um, and I'll try to just ask one more, but let's see. These are fun. There's a lot of questions. I'll, I'll, I'll end with this one cause there's a number, but, uh, how, how, uh, how do you develop a client base starting out with smaller scale development, which you started off, um, oh, yeah. with that a little bit. So I think that's an interesting question cause it's not exactly straightforward. All the time. Right. Um, so, I mean, part of the reason I went into development is like, I wanted to not have clients. Um, I found it a little bit awkward, like the, you know, an architect, a, an architectural client, a developer approaches an architect, especially if it's an architect that doesn't have a ton of built world, you know, it's like, okay, they pay you to design this, whatever. And then the art as architects, we're like taught to care about all this stuff of, you know, social justice and ecology and beauty and urbanism and da, 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 you know, all these values that we're supposed to express. And sometimes a client cares about some of those. The pure developer client might not care about much at all. Mm -hmm. You know, as we rent, sort of, right? And that's it. Um, and someone building a home might care about a few of them, but not others. And then there's some negotiation of like, okay, do I just express their values, right? In a built form, is that my job as the architect to just say, or is it my job to like convince them of mine of convince them to care about all the things that I was taught to care about in architecture school, but then they're paying me to convince them of that. Or am I just supposed to kind of subvert them? their will, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, like, Oh, I'm going to sneak in these green features that we're going to have to pay a little more for whatever. And I just found that whole thing a little bit weird. I was, I didn't feel comfortable in either three of those. They I don't sound comfortable when you I describe them. Either three. I was like, man, I can't like just be a, arm of this client developer is just to do, I, I have a professional obligation. I'm a professional, I have public op obligation. Yeah. Um, nor should I be subverting them. They're paying me. I'm have a fiduciary responsibility to them. And it also feels weird from, I mean, there, there's part of that convincing each other. And sometimes I can make a little bit better project. But if it's way far off, you know, if it's like, hey, I want to do this in a, um, a Tudor style and it's way suburban and it's like a gated community. I'm just like, well, I, you know, ah, yeah, I think we're too far away. Yeah. And so I, I think that was really hard. It's just kind of getting off track from the question. But I think to so maybe the what I'm thinking of is how do you attract clients that are going to share your values and are people you really want to work with? Yeah. And, are going to leak. And I think that's just doing good work, right? Yeah. It's doing work that um, people see and yeah. eventually it comes and it takes time to build that. No, there's I mean, a... I don't have a lot of clients, so I'm probably not a good person <laughs> to ask. Well, I, I, I get that. I mean, we, we, there is, I have similar struggles too about, um, you got to be true to yourself. And also like, you can't just be like, you got to, you also have to work with the world where it is yes, too, you have to be true you know? to yourself in but, a way that works in the world. <laughs> yeah. But it has to work. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're going to be able to do more of that as you get older and get more successful. And I don't mean that's selling out or something. I just mean, of course that's the case. And I think, I think that probably takes some humility, like young, like you can't just do whatever you want unless no, you can. No, I mean, no, if you got no, the money, no, great, no, go, go do you whatever can. you want. But, uh, I can't, you can't, most people can't. No. Um, that's interesting. And actually, so I got a couple more small ones, um, shorter ones. Best high-end items, amenities, finishes. So any of those things. Best high-end items, amenities, or finishes to splurge on, which bring the greatest return. Ooh, that's I a like great that one. Question. Yeah. Um, I think 
lighting, but not necessarily light fixtures. You know, just how you light a space become is super important. I think landscaping is always worth it. And it's one of the few things that like, you know, you come back to your building in five years, it's going to look worse, except the landscaping should look better. You know, that's kind of magic. It's a good one. Landscaping, that's kind of yeah. Maybe a, a brick a masonry building looks better. You know, like some things wear well, and, right. and but most buildings, you know, are going to look a little worse. It's going to look a, a little bit worse. Right. Those are probably my two favorites. If I'm going to have to splurge on something, and then anything you touch, you yeah. know, any like a door even handle or foot, something, a door or, handle. Yeah. Like I mean, I I often design things with less doors than you should have because I'm doing solid core. I'm doing kind of heavier hardware and stuff. And I'm just like, to me, that's a hundred percent worth it yeah would, value engineering a little bit but yeah yeah value engineer kind of in the plan so i can afford you know if you have 14 doors in your two bed apartment good luck with not do with doing solid doors you know you're, just yeah. like, you're spending a lot yeah you can get down to four you can get maybe you know that then um i like i think you probably share this and probably more than me like something to kind of feel heavy yeah absolutely you know? there's something about that i, don't I know exactly what you're talking about the when it feels just when you ground the door and it just feels light and hollow mm -hmm. i just, just i just hollow. really hate there's something that. american building it's just like something feels hollow yeah. and crap and light and like i mean the light is such a good one uh i like you i've stolen yours don't, don't light walls not air i mean i i don't. said the same thing but without using those words totally i, I was like that's the simplest way to say it. design lighting people who design lighting well already do that right? yeah like light walls not air. light surfaces not air that's what you said yeah yeah but um yeah i think those are my and and more and more i'm thinking about splurging on air like hvsc like thinking about you know there's a lot more that goes into comfort in a house in a building than oh it's 70 degrees right right we could be 50 degrees and in the sun and feel warm yeah right we can be at by five so like I'm still thinking a lot about more like, okay, right. Using an energy recovery ventilator for the first time. And it probably be like, you know, how controlling humidity, thinking about um, surfaces that are emitting heat yeah. and thinking about all these kind of other things that go into like, just make, make exhaust all your hood vents, like actually yeah. exhaust versus recirculating in most apartments. You're so, so a lot of recirculating going yeah, on. Yeah, all those things that are like, I think, you know, most people, they walk into a building, they see everything at, at once and they don't see any of it. It all seeps in, but they can't pick out like right. what they like. They're just like, this is a space I like. And I think air quality is something that matters. Certainly lighting quality. Yeah. And then the tactile for me, that's where if I have to spend money, yeah. if, if I, you know, that's where I really don't want to cut. Yeah, I really don't want to cut there. Yeah, I think it's a great one. I mean, you're interacting with it regularly. I, the other go, I mean, I really not that it, the the air quality one is such a big one. Like I, we're starting, we're really trying to make it just standard where an ERV goes into every house because I just yeah. think it should. Because it's healthy, but it's also healthy for the house. Some of the yeah. things you do for yourself is yeah. also healthy, healthy for right. the house. What are, what are yours? I'm really curious too. Where's yours? If you have to like cut back, you're like the things you're going to defend the most. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like where where do you want to splurge? I guess or where do you want to splurge? You can do it, frame it positive or negative. It's interesting. I think I think hardware. Yeah, I'm 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 touch. hardware and lighting because it's all kind of like the makeup, you know, where they can overcome a lot. Uh, yeah, right. If it's a, a well lit house, can a well lit crap right. apartment can be? And I would nice. you know. Both natural and artificial. I would countertops, like, I think, unless you're just really building, it's nice to get, like, a, a even just a, a black granite or or, or a lower-grade quartz. Yeah. Um, that's just going to be durable and, and look deep. I, I try to stay away from hard finishes that are going to go out of style. Totally. You know, tile and Davis. countertops. It's like, Trendy be tile. really careful so because those are... Use it's trendy expensive paint. to use change. Trendy yeah, paint. use a trendy <laughs> paint. And frankly, I'm okay with even some light fixtures being trendy because it's like, hey, if that goes out in five years and yeah. you want to replace something that's not that expensive, you know, okay, go ahead. Like, that's a good way to do it. Don't do it with your tile and your countertops, your your wood floor <laughs> 100%. or your trim. Like, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I use wood floors and um, or concrete on everything. Yeah. I don't yeah. ever use LVT. Yeah, we use wood on um, everything too. And I like, you know, 
Oh, I like casement windows, right? Those they aren't really more expensive them. anymore. They're not more expensive. They I used to be, but they're really not. We only use casements. Yeah. I just love that, like, where the whole thing opens up. I also like it visually, but visually, it's just you cleaner. Have, you don't have yeah. to break. It feels cleaner. It doesn't leak as much air. Yep. Yeah. Like plus on casements. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think they'll yeah. um, move to being more standard. Right. I think casements are the way to go. I think ERV is probably my, for like, it's outside of like, things you're touching is ERV and then in the type of insulation where I think we're really just, we're trying to only do either mineral wool, formaldehyde free mineral wool. Cause some of them have oh, formaldehyde no, in them. I have to worry about it. Great. And then, uh, hemp wool, you know, uh, which we have not used yet. I've been keeping an eye on it. I've actually got a call with them this week, hemp texture, and they've started to plan out in is it Idaho have... or South. Okay. Is yeah. it South Dakota? I know sure. it's kind of somewhere. I Hemp's think it might be good. Idaho and they've got a manufacturing facility and everything. And it's supposed to be just super clean. It handles water. Well, it's kind of hydrophobic, yep. so it doesn't absorb it. Right. You know, it kind of lets it run through. Um, so we're, we're thinking about, you know, always doing either one of those. You still need to air seal. So that's kind of the, you either got to caulk or do just a little bit of closed cell and then that or something. But, but that's where we really do you could, still need to air seal a structural masonry house. Not if it's structural masonry. Okay, no, good. but, but yeah. Yeah. Well, Sam, thanks a ton for totally. coming on. Thanks so much. Love to do it again. Yeah, I'd love to. All right. Thanks for listening. I will definitely be having Sam on again. Please comment. Let me know what you think. Um, whether you're listening on YouTube or Spotify, you can, you can drop a comment. Um, and be sure to check out the rest of our podcast on our Spotify or Apple or YouTube channel. We've also got, I've also got a newsletter that I'm starting to publish. You can go to Playbook dot buildingculture.com playbook.buildingculture.com and i'm exploring some interesting things there about the built environment and meaning and culture and entrepreneurship and really the intersection of all of that how do we build great places again um yeah i really would love to hear from everyone so like subscribe and share and talk to you next time